All right, welcome to the Real Crusades History Podcast. We are back for episode six in our exciting series on the First Crusade. Last time we uh, left off with the conclusion of the Siege of Antioch and the Crusaders' great victory over Kerbaga in 1099. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the situation that the Crusaders found themselves in once they had secured Antioch. And the question became, okay, now what? Uh, when do we march on Jerusalem? Uh, do we march on Jerusalem immediately? And we're going to find, I think, in this podcast that um, this question kind of remained unanswered for, for uh, quite a long time and became kind of the major next issue that the Crusaders had to deal with as the crusade progressed. So uh, my name is Jay Stephen Roberts. I'll be hosting. I am joined, of course, by Scott Amos. Scott, welcome, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, Stephen, and uh, as always, good to be here. Glad you have you, you having me on. Absolutely, we're glad to have you as usual. And uh, Rand, welcome. How are you, my friend? Pretty good. Glad to be here. All right, and we're welcoming our act academic guest, Dr. William Hamblin. Dr. Hamblin, who runs an excellent. Uh, online repository of information about Crusades military history called crusadingwarfare.net. So, Dr. Hamblin, welcome to you. How are you, sir? Great. We're happy to be here. Excellent. So, yeah, it's kind of amazing to me. We're already in our sixth episode of this uh, series. It seems like just yesterday we were just starting it. Um, and we have really come a long way through the First Crusade. And this is kind of an interesting period for me because we sort of see this conflict between Raymond of Toulouse and Bohemond kind of come to a head. And so, so yeah, really in, in the immediate aftermath of the battle at Antioch, uh, Bohemond had quite a bit of, of prestige. He really had been kind of the, the mind behind the strategy that led to this successful battle against Kerboga. And he already had a lot of control of uh, Antioch anyway. And what he really was asking for, uh, once this all was done, is he wanted Antioch to, to be his. Basically, he was going to rule Antioch as, uh, uh, well, but under a title which is going to come to be known as the Prince of Antioch, because Antioch is going to become this, uh, basically the second of the Crusader states established by the First Crusade, the Principality of Antioch, uh, with Bohemond as uh, kind of its, its first prince. Um, Meanwhile, Raymond of Toulouse also still had some uh, parts of Antioch that he was maintaining control of, but he had been less involved in kind of this final great, uh, you know, push to secure Antioch, uh, you know, where they defeated Kerboga. He'd been ill through most of that. And um, it seems that for the most part, the, the leaders of the crusade seemed fairly willing to go along with Bowman's idea of letting him have Antioch. And uh, Raymond still really resisted that. And I know that, uh, you know, there, I think there are some, there, there's, this, there's this idea out there among some, uh, you know, you'll get this in some books, for example. Like I, years ago, I, I read this biography of Raymond IV of Toulouse by John and Loretta Hill, these professors from Texas. And uh, they argued that Raymond of Toulouse really was trying to maintain the original pact made with Alexius. However, Christopher Tyerman, uh, in God's War, he actually says, well, really, Raymond was kind of using that as a way to maintain his own ambitions. You know, Raymond didn't have a lot of the popular support among the army that Bohemond had. And but he still was very ambitious. And we do know that Raymond did want to establish um, some sort of territory for himself in uh, the Levant. But that, um, so he kind of used this insistence upon uh, this initial agreement with, with uh, Alexius as kind of his way to try to counter Bohemond, who, who enjoyed uh, popularity among the, uh, you know, the rank and file that, that Raymond did not enjoy. So I don't know. Um, Let's kind of take it up from here. Um, Dr. Hamblin, as our academic guest, I'd like to have you open with us uh, on what your thoughts are on this current situation and what do you think about this, this uh, feud between 
Raymond and Bowman and how it impacted the, the direction of the crusade and these, these months after the Battle of Antioch? I think that the, there, there's a kind of an antecedent issue to this, and that is uh, the oath to Alexius, which basically said they would give back all of the cities that they captured that had once belonged to Byzantium. And Antioch was one of those cities. It had only been conquered by the Turks about uh, 12 or 13 years before the Crusaders take the city. So in a very real sense, uh, that oath should have returned the city to Alexius. However, the Crusaders, uh, when they took the oath to Alexius, understood that he himself should come and that he should send an army to support the crusade and so forth. So because he had essentially abandoned the crusade at, uh, upon hearing from Stephen and other crusaders that the crusade had been lost, uh, the crusaders come to say that his uh, claims are, are void because he has forsworn the oath. So then the question becomes, who gets the city? If Alexius doesn't get the city, who should have it? And this launches the struggle between Bohemond and Raymond. Now, Raymond probably, uh, as you say, uh, wanted to establish a power base for himself. And this is this points to a fundamental flaw, flaw in the entire crusader endeavor, and that is there is no absolute leader. There's no um, central command. Now, it kind of had been Adamar, but he's going to die uh, shortly after the conquest of uh, Antioch by from probably from typhoid, from a plague of some sort. And, and so that left essentially four leaders, all of them very proud, all of them with different ambitions, and uh, none of them wanting to kind of submit to the other. Uh, and, and so, you know, you have to form a consensus to make this operate and the consensus isn't there. And once, once Kerboga is gone and that threat is gone, then the, these fissures within the crusader movement uh, manifest themselves. And, and one of these is who's going to get what city. And so Raymond in a sense is opting for uh, Alexius. I mean, he's, he's saying he's supporting that claim and, and probably in a way he was. But what I think he's really tried to do is establish himself as the supreme leader of the crusade. And if Bowman submits to him, then he kind of has elevated the position of the, the commander. So I think it's less about um, actual possession of Antioch and more about authority within the crusading movement that they're struggling about. Uh, Raymond eventually will establish his own principality, but at this point, so, so that was part of his goal. But at this point, I, I really think it's more about a struggle for power and authority than the question of who's going to have Antioch. And if Raymond can use Alexius's claim to undermine Bohemond, then that boosts his authority, boosts Raymond's authority. So that's kind of what I think is going on in this case. And, and these problems are going to continue and manifest themselves in various ways throughout the coming uh, eight or ten months of the crusade. Yeah, that's, that's some good points there, Dr. Hamblin. And I think one thing we should kind of take a step back and look at is the fact that despite the fact that there was clearly a power struggle going on between these crusade leaders and the fact that, you know, somebody like Bowman or Raymond of Toulouse, they were very interested in establishing these, these states for themselves. That doesn't really mean that their religious motivations were insincere. Like, I think it's interesting, you know, Raymond of Toulouse, we're talking about somebody who was undoubtedly one of the most wealthy and, or one of the wealthiest and one of, and, and a very powerful individual himself back in Europe. He was the Count of Toulouse. Uh, he controlled this vast territory in uh, what is today Southern France. He was really more, more powerful and uh, wealthy at this time than the King of France even. And yet he chose to kind of, you know, abandon all that and head off for this grueling, you know, uh, pilgrimage to Jer armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Um, you well, know, and he was a very old man too. Um, and I, th I think we can kind of look at it like, uh, you know, this was something he was doing at the end of his life as kind of a final spiritual uh, mission, if you will. But that, but he, st he, but he was still interested at the same time in this 
in this acquisition of territory. And you know, we kind of touched on this in some earlier podcasts that um, for the Crusaders, you know, these these weren't mutually exclusive things at all. Almost in the way that we kind of almost instinctively, from a modern perspective, look at look at this sort of issue. But but yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. The the uh, spirituality in no ways in no way uh, conflicted with the fact that God should grant his servants uh, victory and God should grant them uh, you know do dominion over. Uh, the kingdom that God is granting them through uh, the crusading victories. So th there, it's, it's, it's much more like a, the perspective of ancient Israel and the conquests of Canaan. Uh, mm -hmm. these, th this is God's deeds for the Franks, which is the name of one of the, uh, 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 <laughs> one of the primary chronicles. sources of the crusades, yeah. right, one of the chronicles. And, and so... Uh, God is doing this, and they are doing this for spiritual reasons, but their reward will be both uh, either martyrdom in heaven or, uh, you know, a, a lordship in uh, the east, in the crusader lands. Now, some people, I, I think uh, Robert of Normandy really had no interest in founding a, uh, a state in the east. Mm -hmm. he's, he's just there to do the crusade, and when he's done, he goes back, but others, uh, you know, are, are much more interested in that. One other thing we should note is that Raymond's uh, standing, his feudal standing in, in Europe, is one of the great princes of Europe, whereas Bohemund is kind of a a sideshow of the uh, he's of the Norman kingdom in southern Italy. He's not even, you know, the leader of that kingdom. He's, he's a secondary lord in that regard, and so the 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 relative status within the whole feudal uh, structure of the medieval world put Raymond at the pinnacle and Bohemond kind of in the middle. And so for Raymond, this is it's obvious who should be in charge. He's the greatest prince. Bohemond's uh, you know second tier. Yeah, Bohemond was uh, basically a disinherited son in a lot of ways. Um, he kind of had to, to fight tooth and nail to, to hold on to what small uh, part of Norman Italy that, that he could. So, so yeah, interesting stuff. So, so yeah, in terms of the situation that the Crusaders were in at this point, uh, you, you had some, some good notes here about this, Scott. Um, how do you view kind of the situation in the, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the victory against Caraboga, Scott? What do you think? They were in good shape. Yeah, I mean, where they had been. So they controlled the, these ports of Saint. Simeon yeah, they controlled Latakia and Saint Simeon, and uh, you know, Baldwin of Boulogne had uh, uh, what would become the county of Edessa. You know, the Crusaders, the leader, direct leadership in Antioch had. Had, uh, even though you know the squabbles were going on, they were in control of the surrounding territories. They gained a lot from you know material materially from the victory over over Kerboga, You know, in terms of just what they captured. Uh, yeah, and I guess to some extent, really, this is uh, when the establishment of the Principality of Antioch begins. Yeah, and, yeah. And the same with. You know, I think the the same with the with the county of Edessa. I mean, it was kind of nascent. I mean, it was ongoing. You know, the, I guess the Crusader states wouldn't completely solidify as such until after it was all over. I mean, they didn't, but mm -hmm. but it was all. You know, that they they controlled a vast amount. I mean, they had essentially taken control of, and then uh, Cilicia. You know. Tancred and Bohemond had established those positions there. Uh, and at this point, I guess, um, you know, we're going to have Bohemond kind of mopping up some of these castles close to Antioch. Yeah. That are going to sort of form Antioch's hinterland as we, as we go into the east. Because um, there were quite a few, you know, these, these various Syrian castles that would... Holdouts that were still there. Yeah. And so... Uh, what, one yeah, thing to add to that, I, I, I agree with Scott, but I think we should note a couple things. One is, uh, through their victories, they've been able to acquire uh, more horses. 
Mm. And that's yeah. going to, to uh, move their army back to a night-centered uh, force, whereas in the Battle of Antioch, it had been mainly infantry that did the work. I think oh, far, oh, excuse me, Bill. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, yeah, the, 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 they captured quite a number of horses from Kerboga's army, and then I guess the, the markets were... You know, oh, I mean, that the, the horses were available available for purchase where they mm -hmm. hadn't been before, so that problem was was solved. Yeah, the the other thing, uh, I, I think they needed a couple months of recuperation, so so they weren't they were in a good position, but but they kind of needed uh, because of all the the strains of the previous months, they needed a couple months to rest, and also they decided to wait for uh, till November 1st to move on because of issues of climate and pasture and, and availability of water. So uh, their position strategically was very good, but it took a couple of months to develop into, uh, you know, its maximum potential uh, before, so they don't really move out till I guess four months after the conquest of Antioch. Well, uh, that was kind of, I guess is the question that got raised in my notes about you know how uh, would this delay did it create the conditions that would allow the conflict between Ormond and and um, and Raymond to to you know escalate I mean if they had just decided you know say March hang out for a month and, and then march on immediately you know it, it yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, two princes holding one city. There's a famous uh, Middle Eastern saying that uh, seven uh, Sufis or dervishes can sleep on one carpet, but uh, two rulers cannot uh, live in a single kingdom. Yeah. So, so if one of them had met, you know, if, if that had been, say if Ottomar hadn't died and, and he had, Brought his authority to bear between Raymond and 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 Bormond, maybe things would have turned out differently. Right. You know, he would have put his foot down and 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 said, "Okay, one of you guys is going to do." You know, Bormond's going to stay here, and Ramon is going to go on, or you know, whatever. And, and, and they would have would have followed his lead. From what I under, I mean, from what I understand of his uh, amount of the amount of influence he held. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So, and as as you guys kind of mentioned, there's this council on July third in which they decide they are going to take several months to to recuperate the army. So that happens, and um, July is also when Bishop Adamar dies. Correct. Yeah. Yes, he died on August the 1st. Okay, oh. August the 1st. Okay. So, yeah, and we've, we've already kind of gone over how that was sort of a, a, a further challenge to the unity of the army because Adamar as this bishop and the papal legate had this, this status as, as kind of a unifying force, kind of the, the voice of the pope almost um, uh, among the crusaders. And the next major action that's going to take place is towards the end of the year, there's going to be this attack on the city of Mara. So this is actually a joint operation between uh, Raymond and, Bo and Bohemond. And it, it, as I understand it, this was, this was kind of a, a move towards maybe creating some more of a compromise between the two of them. The idea was that this was going to be a city that, that Raymond could rule. Is, is that right, Dr. Hamblin? To, to some degree, I think um, Raymond goes goes off to take uh, Marat, and then Boyman uh, joins him later. And and but yeah, Raymond is essentially uh, moving on, not fully marching to Jerusalem, but beginning to try to establish his own uh, base of operations. So he's the, pretty well accepted that Boyman is. is not necessarily he's rejected him, but he's he's going to strengthen his position by having uh, castles, cities, military bases that he can use. Um, so, and he tries this again at Arca uh, later in the crusade in February 1099. Uh, so I, I think that's what's going on. 
So do we want to talk a little bit about what happens at Mara? This is sort of a notorious moment in the crusade. The crusaders are able to capture this city. There's, there's some fairly fierce resistance from the defenders. Um, once they get into the city, they sack it. And the result is that they're um, there's actually a, a situation of famine that develops for the, the occupying force. Um, does anybody want to talk about exactly what happens at Mara? Well, seeing as how I was the one that uh, brought it up in our last discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. The, the, the incidents of cannibal, or the allegations of cannibalism that occurred at, at Marat, um, is a, it's always, you, you always hear this every time modern commentators or modern scholars, especially if it's more popular history. So, you know, if you, if you watch the history channel on the crusades, you're going to get, uh, you know, uh, and then the crusaders committed cannibalism, you know, on, on their way. It, it always turns into this huge, uh, topic of discussion just because it's, it, it's, it's bizarre and it's, and it's, uh, um, you know, and, and I'm sure it, I'm sure it does wonders for, for ratings and viewership, but, um, but really there's an interesting historical, dis uh, an interesting scholarly discussion regarding what exactly this, this cannibalism was and what it, what exactly it consisted of, because really in the, in the actual primary sources, you don't get a whole lot of mention of it at all with the exception of Fulker of Chartres. Fulker of uh, is really the only Crusades Chronicle who really covers it in, in, in great detail. Um, and basically what he describes is um, either in the midst of the siege or in the aftermath of the siege uh, that, there were, that there were some among the Crusader host who, you, you know, poorer, poorer fighters in the Crusader host who um, stripped – uh, some flesh off the dead uh, that that were that were laying. Stripped some flesh off the Muslim dead that were that were there, uh, you know, in, in the city and on, and on the you know on the field. Um, now, one thing that's always been pretty consistent in the history of human warfare is um, th there's there's a tendency for isolated events to get blown out of proportion and you sort of play this game of historical telephone um, where the details expand and they get more and more fantastic and then and then uh, you know the opposing sides hear about it and they blow it out of you know they, they blow it out of even more proportions um, you know to suit their own uh, propaganda needs and etc um, so the 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 thing that to to look with this is you know not not to sound like you know not to sound like an apologist or anything like that, but what Fulker of Schott describes was probably some, some a, a very uh, a very minor incident, very isolated minor incident that probably for for uh, very good reasons stuck out in his memory. Um, when he when he wrote it, you know, something to remember is that the 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 Christian West uh, at the time had the exact same attitude towards cannibalism uh, that we would have today. Probably even they would probably be even more revolted uh, at the idea because uh, they actually were a, a, a fairly spiritual and very religious society, um, and so the idea of cannibalism was extremely taboo. Uh, according to medieval Christianity, the tenets of medieval Christianity, and uh, I think the reason why it it stands out so prominently in his record is uh, because Fulker, if he witnessed it or if he heard about it firsthand, was probably horrified uh, and was aghast that it had happened at all. Um, so you know, it's just unfortunately, you know, in in modern times, people with an agenda have uh, you know, seized upon that, and they've, you know, and they've they've committed the same crime that, uh, uh, you know, many others throughout history have have committed, and that is uh, that of historical exaggeration, um, in service of a, of an agenda. Um, but uh, as far as the actual cannibalism itself, there's another 
interesting discussion, and I know John France references it. Um, a couple others reference it, but um, there were these there were the, there's these fighters in the Crusader army referred to as toughers, T A F U R S, and no one's terribly quite sure who the toughers were. Um, they they appear to be uh, commoner common soldiers from the Low Countries. Uh, from like the Flanders region, um, but uh, they're described as almost sort of like uh, almost sort of like a berserker type infant type unit, um, and they uh, they they end up getting this kind of they, they were sort of the they they were sort you know if, if if you're if you're applying the rules of survival of the fittest to the 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 poorer uh, members of the army these were the guys who'd made it. You know, by you know, by hook or by crook, these were the guys who had survived, and so they were. Some of them were probably a little, probably a little crazy, um, you know, and had probably had a pretty ferocious reputation uh, militarily, um, and you know, at a time when psychological warfare, uh, you know, or, or just you know, the the psychological impact on warfare had a had a played a major part. Um, there was one historian, and I can't remember his name, uh, unfortunately, but he uh, he wrote a very interesting piece on what the cannibalism that Fulker may have thought was going on may have not been actual cannibalism, and he he referred to uh, accounts of Norman mercenaries who were who had fought in service of the Byzantine Empire um, during you know before the First Crusade, and some of them. Uh, almost, almost by me, almost as a as a means of psychological warfare, encouraged sort sort of tacitly encouraged these myths amongst the Turkish amongst their Turkish enemies that they that they ate people, um, <laughs> and, and that it was sort of like it was like this, uh, you know, it was kind of like oh my god, these guys are insane, you know, they eat people, you know, um, and so it it, it kind of raised the question of again. Was this even cannibalism, or you know what? There, there are there are there are quite a few different ways of looking at the the incidents of cannibalism during the First Crusade um, that you know uh, sh that that steer pretty far from the 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 postmodern popular misconception of oh these were these are a bunch of raving religious fanatics who uh, who ate you know who ate uh, the the bodies of, of pagans and all this kind of stuff. It's um, that that idea just doesn't seem very feasible uh, when you when you look at the when you look at the actual the actual history of the times and the cultural mores that that, that existed. Um, it, I guess in conclusion, you know, we're, we're looking at either one of two things, or more more likely a combination of a couple of things. It was probably there were probably extremely isolated incidents of extremely desperate people. Um, that's that's something that. Uh, is no stranger to the modern era, uh, to modern warfare. You've got incidences uh, even as recently as um, as the Chechen War, uh, the Chechen Wars uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, where where cannibalism occurred, where instances of cannibalism occurred, um, and uh, and then it was probably psychological, uh, you know, sort of reputations that real than they really were. Um, you know, in the, in the minds of people who experienced it. So, um, I, I know I kind of rambled on there for a little bit, but uh, I I hope, uh, I hope I hope hope that fills it in for some of the folks listening. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good overview of it. And there is a brief mention of this incident in the letter that Raymond and. Godfrey sent to Pope Urban, I, I believe after they conquered Jerusalem, they, they said, basically what they say is that when they captured Mara, there was uh, a famine that broke out, and some people, unfortunately, ate uh, flesh off of some of the dead. And they say that it was a, and they even, you know, point out in the letter how, what a horrible thing this is, and, you know, what a, this is kind of a, a grotesque tragedy that befell uh, s some of the suffering soldiers. So, you know, I think it's 
Yeah, I mean, certainly we, we can say that, you know, that, w- that was the attitude that uh, the Crusaders themselves had about this. And it's, it's really just, yeah, it's kind of a very minor thing. So, uh, Dr. Hamblin, any comments on the, the Siege of Mara? And you don't just have to talk about the cannibalism. You can, you can talk about the whole thing if you want. But. Um, well, there's actually a, a number of Crusader sources which mention it. Uh, some of them are dependent upon one another, but uh, I think the fundamental question is uh, in, in situations of starvation, especially in sieges in that type of uh, situation, uh, sometimes people turn to cannibalism. I, I mean, it's, it's a well-attested fact throughout history in lots of different circumstances. Uh, that doesn't mean that the crusaders were cannibals that means there were a lot of, of people who were starving to death and in, in the final act of desperation they they turned to cannibalism uh, it, it has nothing to do with whether they're crusaders or not it has to do with their situation in starving to death and you know i've never starved to death and <laughs> I've never come close to starving to death i have exactly the opposite problem eating too much but uh the when you reach that state where basically you are your body is consuming itself your uh you 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 tend to start going mad too i mean there's there's issues with with blood flow to the brain and all sorts of other stuff that's going on and i find it completely believable that that some of the crusaders uh you know having reached the state where they were dying uh did anything they could think of to try to uh, to stay alive, and that's what the body instinctively would do. E- you know, even uh, regardless of what culture or wherever you come from. So it certainly wasn't everybody. It was uh, simply a fact that the people, some of the people, were starving to death. And and all of the Crusader sources that that mention it. Uh, are shocked by it. This is not something that they uh, approve in any way. Uh, and so the fact that they mention it and they hate it and they're shocked by it would indicate they'd have no reason to lie, right? This is uh, counterintuitive that they would lie about their own people uh, cannibalizing. You know, they might lie about the Muslims doing it, but they're not going to lie about their own people. If they say they did it, I think they certainly did it. But again, it, it was, a, it was, you know, not a thing that the Crusaders were doing because they were Crusaders. It, it's a thing that starving people did because they were starving to death. Yeah. This brings up that. one more point. Uh, the disparity between the wealthy contingent and the common men i mean the the why didn't the leaders provide for the common men i mean the, the you know so they wouldn't have to engage in this you know at, at this point um i would have to say there there was probably a lot less of a disparity than than we might think there is um you know i mean they many of the sources attest to um you know, the many of the leaders who had resources, the few who had resources, considerable resources with them, like Raymond, um, literally having to give everything, you know, having to, to compensate out of their own resources quite a few times just to keep uh, people alive. Um, and I think one of the things that you may be seeing at this stage is that even their resources are starting to run low. Um, and that, you know, maybe, you know, Rit, you know, maybe someone even as, even as fabulous, fabulously wealthy as Raymond was, was maybe not so wealthy at this point. Um, well, you know, it, it, you, you can't eat gold. And yeah. So no matter how much money you have, if there's no food available, there's no food available. But yeah. the, the rich were in a position where they could pay, you know, five times as much as, a goat was worth and get it. The poor were not in the position to do that. And if there's not enough goats, there's not enough goats. And it doesn't, you know, you, you could, if you share the goat with everyone, then everyone's starving to death. And so the rich yeah. could get the goat 
Uh, well, you know, to me, this this all just feeds into the whole idea of the you know arrogant aristocracy and the oppressed peasants, you know that kind of thing. You know. Um, well, you know, maybe that becomes part of the myth. Sure. So, something to also keep in mind is that many of these, many of the noble leaders, they had personal retinues that they had to maintain, personal retinues of knights that they had to personally maintain. Right. You know, not all the not all the pilgrims and the peasants who were coming along really belonged to anybody. You know, mm -hmm. they they weren't. Um, you know, they, these were in in the grand sense of things, they were sort of hangers on. Right. Know? And, and, uh, you know, even if a Lord had still had resources and still had, was able to acquire food, he was probably going to give that to his guys first, the guys who actually depended on him and who right. he depended on, uh, you know, they were going to get it first. It, it's just, and that was just a matter of military necessity. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a class thing. It wasn't, um, you know, like, like the, like the Marxist historian would scoff at. That's, you know, what, I, that's what I was getting at, Rand. You know, it's kind of this whole narrative that, that's come about. Yeah. Know. Oh, no, no. And, and it's, you know, thank you, Karl Marx, um, for your extremely flawed vision of history. But, um, you know, it, no, it, it wasn't. It, it had way more to do with actual just the way that, that warfare occurred during that time, that certain certain groups of people got precedence over others. Um, well, and it was, and it, was also, it was also assumed that each individual soldier should uh, feed himself. And that's, why, for his own, yeah. and, and that's why they were so fanatical about getting plunder. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was how they stayed alive. It's not that they were greedy. It's that if we don't get some plunder from whatever town they take, we're not exactly. going to have any food and we're not going to have any money to buy food in the future that we could have gotten, yeah. you know, through the plunder. So, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's all linked into uh, both the, the problems of logistics that they faced as a whole. And then the specific problem of, of how a, a medieval army uh, in these circumstances fed itself. And, and that was yeah. through foraging and, and plundering food. Yeah, good points, everybody. So, Dr. Hamblin, a, a, a couple oh. other things to note on on uh, uh, first of all, there's an article by a guy named Jay Rubenstein who's also written uh, uh, the, the Armies of Heaven. Anyway, it's an article called Cannibals and Crusaders, uh, and you could look that up online and, and get the information. But anyway, he's gone through all the sources uh, and all the secondary studies and just kind of summarizes the whole situation. Uh, so it's a good article just to get a sense of. I think, I think, if I'm correct, that may have been who I was referring to. Oh, okay. um, that that Could name be. sounds familiar. I just I couldn't remember his name for the life of me. Yeah, um, yeah but I think he was the one. Yeah, I think I think I think Rubenstein was the one who who brought up the whole, uh, you know, that that uh, you know, Norman mercenaries and Byzantine service had, you know, used sort of a sort of an urban legend of cannibalism to you know inspire dread amongst uh you know their their enemies and stuff like that so that um but yeah I, i'm i'm pretty sure he's the one that i that i read yeah anyway um, i just couldn't remember his name yeah i'm reading armies of heaven right now and he's he he makes quite a big deal out of it well uh the other thing to note about marat numan is that uh the city was sacked quite uh, brutally, which was not uncommon in the Middle Ages. But it, the the long term impact of of both Antioch and Marat Numan is to uh, terrorize the other Muslim city states that surround the area. They have lost the main uh, army, Karaboga's army, that could defend them. They have no political structure to work together. Each city state is a rival of the other city states. And, and now they face these crusaders who they know if they uh, fight them, there's gonna be massacres and sacking the town and plundering and so forth. And so what we find is that, that these tactics terrorize the Muslim city states, making the rest of the march to Jerusalem uh, much more feasible because they go past these city states and basically extort money and supplies from them 
and that allows them then to keep marching. Uh, so rather than sack the city, they're they're basically extorting you know ten percent or twenty percent or whatever of the food that the city has, and so the the brutality of the sacks of Antioch and Marat Numan uh, worked to the Crusaders' advantage by uh, you know essentially making the rest of the city states unwilling to stand up to them. Right. So, Dr. Hamblin, uh, why don't you talk to us a little bit about this phase in the Crusade? Like, once Mara falls, um, what situation are we in in terms of politically with, you know, the, the uh, feud between Raymond and Bowman? And how is the Crusade going to progress at that point? Well, uh, Raymond uh, essentially takes Marat, but Bohemond manages to capture some of the towers and, and gates and so forth. So, so he exactly reverses the situation in Antioch. And he basically says to Raymond, look, I'll give you Marat and these towers if you'll give me the towers that you control and the, uh, the gatehouse and palace and so forth in Antioch. And uh, Raymond basically doesn't want to do that because that gives the biggest city in the region for a, a second tier city. Uh, so, so the struggle then continues on between uh, Raymond and Bohemond. And after this siege, Bohemond uh, doesn't really participate in a serious way in the rest of the crusade. He, he goes back to Antioch and spends his time securing the strategic base of Antioch for the crusaders. Uh, Tancred, however, does carry on with the rest of the group. So, so Southern Normans are there. And in fact, it seems that the anonymous uh, author of the Gesta, who was a knight in uh, Norman knight, Southern Italian Norman, he, he uh, switches and joins one of the other princes when Bowman stays behind. So, so that creates a, a bit of a problem for the Crusaders in, in two ways. Number one, Bohemond is the best military commander, as far as we can tell. And, and secondly, there's a lot of men under him that don't come. So, that, so they lose you know, 10, 15 percent of their army uh, to basically occupy and uh, the, the, the land that they conquered in the north, that is between uh, Baldwin and Bohemond, a significant portion of the army is uh, stays behind. Now, strategically, that's necessary, but tactically, it makes the uh, siege of Jerusalem more difficult. Um, another thing that develops is that the poor, who some of these people had been the, the, the cannibals, they're out of money, they're out of supplies. They, if they stay in Marat, as Raymond kind of wants to do, he wants to occupy the city and make it a base for his, a power base for his own uh, domain that hopefully he could conquer. The, the poor in the army are in a terrible state. They need plunder to survive. And if they sit in a town and don't have anything to plunder, they're, they're going to start starving again like they did, which led to some of them uh, cannibalizing. So what they do is they, there's actually a revolt of, of a lot of the poor soldiers. Uh, and they uh, start tearing down parts of the walls of, of Marat. They, they do that so that Raymond can't occupy the city and defend it. A city with, with destroyed walls or partially destroyed walls is essentially indefensible. So, so Raymond, uh, they're, they're trying to force his hand and say, look, if you want us to stay, you know, feed us. If you can't feed us, we need to go on. And Raymond says, well, I want to stay and occupy the city and make a power base and they destroy the part of the walls. So there's this rebellion of the, of the local people. And, and in part, it's a matter of, you know, we've been on the road for three or four years now. We want to get to Jerusalem. You know, we're sick of these nobles squabbling over all the wealth and plunder that they can get. You know, our goal is a spiritual goal to get to Jerusalem. So that's part of it. The other part is, we don't have any money, we don't have any food. If we stay here, we're going to be starving again. And so let's go on and conquer some other place. Now, what, what the, the, the good part of this is that as they start to advance, Raymond is essentially forced to start to advance. And he sets out with uh, Robert of Normandy and Tancred, uh, who, who go with him. But Bohemond stays in Antioch, and Godfrey and Robert of Flanders are kind of holding back that they'll join later a couple months later after Raymond goes. 
So he's going with only uh, maybe, you know, five to 10,000 combatants. He's setting out on his own basically towards Jerusalem. And he comes to the city of Arca, which is along the coast. He's starting, he, he leaves Marat, he leaves Syria, goes into Lebanon, and then is heading towards Jerusalem. And there's some major developments that occur at sea, at Arca as well, which I don't know if you you want me to press on or should we stop there and uh, recapitulate a bit or? Well, I do think we should we should talk about um, what happens at Arca because this, it's almost like, um, Raymond kind of d- does sort of the the routine at Mara again at Arca. Like right. he sort of attempts to make Arca his new uh, power base, and Arca is is in the domain of the Emir of Tripoli. Right. Right. And the um, the Emir of Tripoli is is more than willing to kind of accommodate the Crusaders. I mean, he wants them to just kind of move on. He's willing to give them some supplies and kind of you know say okay okay. Duh. Head on out, guys. Uh, you know, don't stay here and destroy and destroy my my territory. But um, but yeah, and, and that's that's kind of an interesting point in the crusade because this this actually drags on for months. Uh, Arca is going to be besieged. I, I believe it's from February up until May, isn't it? Is right. that right? About four months, right? Which that's kind of an incredible de- delay. Once again, it's 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 kind of remarkable how how much time. Uh, gets uh, put into this. And I believe also at this point, one of the reasons for the delay though, is that there is some possibility that Alexius might come again. Is, is that correct, you guys? Right. Well, there was a delegation sent, uh, Hugh of Vermandois. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he, went, Alexius, he, went to he, was, he was attacked on the road and, you know, there were various circumstances that slowed him down and, he finally reached to you know reached Constantinople and um, but there was some idea that he was gonna that, that Alexius might send another army and so they're yeah. kind of still holding out on this yeah. idea of an alliance with Alexius but Alexius does not send an army and he doesn't even send a representative well he sends an embassy which meets with the Crusaders at Arca Mm-hmm. Okay. Basic, basically, claims Antioch. The embassy is is you know say, well, you made this promise, give it to us. The Crusaders say, uh, you know, Alexius didn't fulfill his uh, responsibilities as Lord, and if you want us to work with you, you've got to send an army, and preferably Alexius himself should come, but. Basically, that's not going to happen. Alexius doesn't send an army. The embassy is rebuffed, and Byzantine aid basically peters out at this point. They, they, up through Antioch, they've been getting a lot of support in various ways from the Byzantines, not necessarily everything they needed, but a, a significant amount that, that helped the crusade movement. From now on, they're kind of on their own because they break. Uh, it's kind of a final break between the crusaders and Alexius. And is there some indication that at this point, Alexius actually may have been talking with the Fatimids and kind of decided to to sort of strike a deal with the Fatimids that would ultimately sort of kind of yeah, hang the crusaders uh, out to dry. He, he did do that, but I, I don't think his goal was to uh, undermine the crusade necessarily, but to get an alliance against the Seljuks because okay. the, the Turks are the major, still the major threat to Alexius. In a sense, if he if he actually if the Crusaders had given him Antioch, it's it's an isolated city. He had no land route to get there. He could get there by sea, but you know, it, strategically speaking, it makes much more sense for him to take territory that's in, you know, connected uh, clumps that are uh, accessible directly from Constantinople. So, mm-hmm. from his perspective, the Turks are the enemy. And from the Fatimids' perspective, the Turks are their enemy. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and they make an alliance. I, I don't think it was necessarily to undermine the Crusaders, but the Crusaders certainly viewed it in that way. Mm-hmm. That is, they saw yeah, this I as think, a betrayal. I think really it came down to um, you know two groups of people, uh, you know the Byzantines and, and primarily Alexius, and then the and then the, the Latin Crusaders who just had they, they had 
radically different objectives um, in the grand scheme of things. And while they were, you know, while the first crusade may have originally been conceived as something to, uh, you know, that that was supposed to be sort of a mutual beneficial arrangement between the two, um, the the ultimate objectives of, of either group were, were, were not even remotely on the same page. Um, I don't think, realistically speaking, I don't think Alexius had any uh, real attachment to uh, reclaiming Jerusalem and, and the Holy Land. I, I don't think that was something that was even on his radar screen. I think that was, I think it, it may have, it, maybe it was nice. It was a nice sentiment, but, um, but he was facing the, the, the much more immediate threat of Seljuk Turks that were literally on his doorstep um, in Anatolia. So and the Lexus- whereas the Crusaders, whereas the Crusaders couldn't have cared about, what was going on in Anatolia other than these, other than, you know, the Turks that got in their way, essentially, um, their objective was Jerusalem, was the liberation of Jerusalem and, and the, and the Holy land of the gospels that, that was their objective. Um, and so I, I think it just, you just have two groups of people who have very, very different objectives right. and, and, and then it, it's very easy to see how, you know, maybe people on both on either side eventually, uh, you know, have, have this sort of antagonistic relationship with each other, uh, and maybe start to think that the other is not really on their side, and um, you know, there's the suspicion and uh, the mistrust and the and the miscommunication, and, um, and you know, and eventually the, the the relationship becomes very strained. And, and that happens all the time in modern alliances during war. As well. All the time. Yeah. Well, one thing to note is that uh, from Alexius's point of view, his empire is not capable of taking Jerusalem and holding it. Would it put, put a huge military strain and financial strain on his state to do that? His goal is to keep the empire together because it, it had suffered a couple decades of, of really serious defeats and problems, both the Normans taking Italy, the Turks taking Anatolia, the Petronegs on the Balkan frontier and so forth. Uh, so Jerusalem is defendable only to the extent that all of Europe supplies men and money to, to, to defend it. Constantinople alone could not have, have done that. So, so his, from his strategic point of view, it makes no sense to take Jerusalem at this point. Exactly. And I think that Alexius, you know, in terms of the long-term interest of Christendom, I mean, the Byzantine policy at this point probably was the more, ultimately the more feasible one if it had been possible to actually eliminate the Turkish presence in Anatolia, that would have had more important long-term consequences. And I'm talking about centuries, I guess, for, for Christendom as a whole, you know, this, I mean, I think that this, uh, conquest of Jerusalem, it's a very kind of powerful and uh, emotional and spiritual thing that's, uh, it's, it's compelling in that respect. But, you know, I, I do think it, it is kind of interesting how, you know, what's gained during the First Crusade, while it is substantial and it does kind of help out with the, the situation for both the Byzantine Empire and it, it does kind of expand Christendom temporarily, it doesn't really solve the long-term issue, I guess, which is the Turkish presence in, in Anatolia, but not to derail us or anything too much. But I, I think there's a couple other things that, that uh, go on at Arca that are worth noting. First of all, uh, the purpose of this is, this is uh, Raymond doing this on his own with a couple of allies. Uh, and his purpose, if he could take that city and castle, he could create a open blockade of Tripoli. Crusaders do this quite a bit. They'll, they'll, in later times, they'll kind of build a castle or something near a major city they want to take and then just blockade it in what I call an open blockade, meaning the, stuff, the soldiers aren't completely surrounding it, but they're harassing it constantly, uh, limiting supplies, raising the prices of anything that gets in, et cetera, et cetera. So his goal is to get this as a base to uh, have an open blockade of Tripoli which ultimately uh, 
they do get and, and uh, you know his family becomes the the princes of that or the counts rather uh so there is a strategic goal but it's not about jerusalem it's about his own domain again uh robert and God, uh, robert of flanders and godfrey join him at uh arca but uh ultimately they can't take the city and they decide to press on and, and this is an important moment in the crusade and that is they realize we cannot take every city between Antioch and Jerusalem. Uh, number one, it takes too long. And number two, there's too many cities. And number three, the cities, some of the cities are very strong, some are weak, but they can't actually completely conquer everything. And so the, they change strategies and the strategy becomes get to Jerusalem and get Jerusalem as, as swiftly as possible. Uh, it takes them basically another generation to conquer all the rest of the land around Jerusalem and Antioch and so forth. Uh, you know, 20, 25 years or so to do that. So uh, from a ultimate strategic point of view, this is an important uh, sh moment of shifting. And that is Jerusalem now becomes the final goal and we're not going to do anything else about who gets what land in between or try to take anything else. It's, it's straight to Jerusalem as fast as possible and, and get the city. Right, and this is in May. Um, right, right. They, they base, and so Arca is not taken, and um, this is the point when they are going to actually press on to Jerusalem. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, what, what happens in between there, Dr. Hamblin? Like, uh, what happens between, I guess we'd say, May and June? Uh, th this is kind of that, that final push before right. we actually uh, get to the Siege of Jerusalem. Basically, once they decide to go, it only takes them a couple weeks to get there. This is not a, a long distance uh, between, uh, you know, the, the whole land of Israel is just, you know, drive it in a day, basically, north to south. So, uh, it doesn't take them long. They decide, number one, to not take the cities, as we mentioned. Number two, they take the coastal road. And they basically do that because they can get some naval support along the way. So that alleviates, to some degree, their logistical issues, is, is by going the coastal road. There's also an inland road that kind of goes from Damascus south and so forth, but they ignore that for the time being. Second thing they do is bypass Muslim cities. They, they don't try to conquer any other city till they get to Ramla, which we can discuss in a moment. But they uh, terrorize or, or negotiate, depending on how you want to call it, uh, to basically demand gold, livestock, food, whatever the city will offer them, horses. The, the different cities give them different things, but each city uh, along the coast is a separate city state. More or less. I mean, you know, there's some links between them, but that means uh, it, it, the Muslim decision is every city for itself. We're going to worry about saving our city so that we don't end up like Marat Numan. Uh, and so they negotiate because they realize the Crusaders don't want us, they want Jerusalem. So let's kick the can down the road and, you know, uh, we'll at least survive. So that becomes kind of the, the response to this. And so the Crusaders are able to uh, get the money and food and horses they need through extorting the Muslim cities that they bypass. And finally, on about the 30th of May, a couple weeks after they leave, they, they move inland from a, around the area of Arsuf, and they come to a city called Ramla, which is deserted. Now, we need to understand that Ramla was a major city with probably 20,000 people or so, but in 1068, there was an earthquake and the city was destroyed in this earthquake, including the fortification walls. And it had only been partially rebuilt and partially repopulated by 30 years later when the Crusaders come by. So, so Ramla is probably marginally defensible uh, because of that earthquake. And, and so the garrison, when the Crusaders come, the garrison flees. And uh, when the people see the garrison flee, they, they panic and they, everybody takes off. So basically it's a ghost town when, uh, when the Crusaders arrive. And this is a crucial uh, factor for them because it gives them a, a base uh, for both the siege, but also kind of a base of operations 
between the coast and uh, Jerusalem that's going to allow them to benefit greatly during the siege of Jerusalem from the arrival of reinforcements and equipment by sea. Right, so, so Ramla um, is occupied. And then the other thing that happens too is the Fatimids abandon Jaffa. And the Crusaders are able to occupy Jaffa, which is the closest port city right. to Jerusalem. So that's, that's going to play an important role as we get into the actual siege of Jerusalem next time. But at this point, um, yeah, the, uh, the Crusaders basically are, are able to complete the march and they're able to, uh, to come up on, on Jerusalem. And, you know, we've got the, the armies of uh, Godfrey, Raymond, and the two Roberts, and then, of course, Tancred. Um, everybody's together again at this point, and they've, right. they've made this march down the coast. So, yeah, I think kind of that sort of le leaves us um, at the end of, of this, this podcast. Uh, next time we're going to be talking about the actual siege of Jerusalem. But does anybody want to say anything about kind of this final... Uh, Point in the in the march on Jerusalem, um, you know, as as we as we're coming up on the siege itself. Comments from anybody? I, Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> I, hear, I, I hear you right, right there. Uh, one thing to add, uh, I think we we can discuss the Fatimid dynasty uh, next time, but we're now moving to the third enemy that the Crusaders face, and that is the Egyptians who are uh, known as the Fatimids, which is a dynastic name. So it's like the Plantagenets or something. Mm -hmm. so, so Fatimid Egypt is, is their new enemy. And in August of 1098, the Crusaders, well, a month or two before, they had crushed Karabolga, which destabilized the uh, Seljukid uh, military power in the region. and. Al Afdal, who is the uh, wazir of Egypt, marches up in August, uh, a couple months later, and takes Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this is going to shift the balance of power in the region from a isolated Turkish warlord who, who the Crusaders would have besieged to facing a city ruled by the most powerful state in the area, that is Fatimid Egypt. So, so, so that phenomenon. Uh, essentially leads to the Crusaders facing a new enemy, uh, Fatimid Egypt, uh, for the rest of the Crusade. Yeah, the Fatimids are a very interesting uh, entity in their own right. So we will be chatting about them uh, definitely next time. And it is also interesting to note, I guess, that at this point, the Crusaders had been in fairly close diplomatic contact with the Fatimids. Um, they had, uh, they had um, an embassy in, in Cairo at this point. Now, I, I don't know if there's still going to uh, be in active discussion with them at, as they're sort of advancing on Jerusalem, but... Uh, I can discuss the diplomacy between them if you want, but maybe we should just leave it for, for next time. Yeah, we can leave it for next time. Uh, it's up that, to you. I'm, I'm happy to discuss good. it. Yeah, I think, is everybody uh, kind of good to, to leave us off here? Yeah, yeah. I'm putting I'm putting it to a popular vote. You know, we are we are a democracy on this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> and we and we don't have nearly the uh, the, the uh, leadership squabbles that uh, the Crusaders had to deal with. So <laughs> we, are, we accept you as Lord as man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unlike Raymond, I guess I kind of uh, I'm able to achieve that that goal, right? <laughs> um, you know, I'm not I'm not cool with that. I'm not cool with that unless you give me a city. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have tri you can have Tripoli later, you know, <laughs> at some point. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, this has been this has been good, guys. Uh, I always enjoy our, our discussions, and I think next time is going to be one of our uh, our really big uh, episodes in this series. It's going to be it's going to be very good. So, the siege of Jerusalem is going to be our next topic. Uh, that is that is the ultimate big climax of the First Crusade. So you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, that's going to be next Tuesday. Uh, everybody's good for next Tuesday, right? Yep. Right. Yep. Yes. Good. So next Tuesday, uh, 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time, Texas time, if you will, 
we're all uh, we're all going to be here once again for episode seven in our epic First Crusade podcast series. Uh, Dr. Hamblin will be back with us, and we will certainly be glad to have his uh, academic expertise to to aid in the discussion. So, so we're all looking forward to that. So you mark your know. calendars. Yep, indeed, mark the calendars. So I'm just going to say thanks to everybody for being with us. Uh, Scott, thanks for your help today. Oh, sure. Always glad to, Stephen. Excellent. And Rand, appreciate having you on board as well. Day is full. Day is full. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and um, uh, so Dr. Hamblin, again, very good to have you with us. Uh, it's, it's great to have your expertise on the panel here. Fun to be here. Good. Well, we'll just talk to everybody uh, next week then. Um, make sure you are here and don't miss this uh, epic portion in the First Crusade podcast series, The Siege of Jerusalem, 1099. We'll see you then. <laughs>